Welcome everybody to today's uh, seminar, Succession Politics and the Future of the North Korean Nuclear Quagmire. My name is uh, Christian Berghardt Wicken, I'm the director of PRIO, and I can immediately say that I claim no particular expertise on the Korean Peninsula, but uh, like probably several of you, I'm here to uh, listen and learn, but uh, I'm also taking it up on myself to facilitate this session. And we're very honored to have here with us today Chung In Moon, who is uh, a professor of uh, political science at the Yonsei University. He uh, is a leading analyst of uh, politics in the Korean Peninsula. He has uh, served in uh, advisory roles for several governments, including the government of uh, Kim Da Jung, who uh, has visited Oslo, uh, amongst other things, in order to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. He has uh, also uh, been visiting Prio on a couple of occasions and even published in one of Prio's journals, namely Security Dialogue, where in fact also today's guest of honor, Shung In Moon, has previously published. Shung In Moon holds a doctorate of political science from the University of Maryland. He uh, in addition, as I said, to his um, academic duties at uh, Yonsei University, he uh, engages in various advisory roles, not only for the South Korean government, but he has also served uh, in uh, important functions for the International Studies Association. He's been a vice president, amongst other things. He is uh, a fellow uh, of the Club of Madrid and has been so for a number of years. And he has also published widely on uh, a number of issues, not the least on the issue that we will uh, discuss today. Uh, for example, he published a book in '96 called Arms Control on the Korean Pencil Peninsula. So uh, he's no newcomer to the issue of today's agenda. We also have with us uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, Espen Bart Eide, who I will introduce a little more fully uh, when his time is coming. Please, Chung In Moon. Oh, yes. Well, you know, let me just get to the topic you know, that is straightforwardly and wage the North Korea nuclear quagmire. The most important you know, issue is whether North Korea has become truly a nuclear weapon state or not. Okay. In order to judge whether a country is a truly nuclear weapon state or not, uh, you got to really look into four you know, important variables. First important variable is nuclear warhead, whether North Korea has acquired nuclear warhead or not. It is generally known that North Korea has acquired four to six nuclear warhead, PU-based, plutonium-based nuclear warhead. That is a fact. And also recently, North Korea has been working on the enriched uranium program. And if they acquire highly enriched uranium program, then they can have uranium-based nuclear bomb too. But it will take, as American intelligence sources have been you know, predicting, that it will take about four to five years for North Korea to acquire you know, uranium-based nuclear bombs. But right now, still, North Korea has plutonium-based nuclear warhead, four to five. And we believe that the North Korea uh, must have stored more you know, uh, you know, plutonium to produce further nuclear warhead. Therefore, as to first you know, criterion called whether North Korea has a nuclear warhead or not, yes, it has. And second important criterion with which we judge whether certain countries nuclear weapons state or not is whether that country has a delivery capability. As the intercontinental ballistic missile, we all believe that North Korea does not have that capability yet. Again, according to Robert Gates, the Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense of the United States, uh, he argues that it would take four to five years for North Korea to acquire you know, intercontinental ballistic missile. Okay? However, North Korea is pro has proved that it has uh, an intermediate range nuclear, has an intermediate range in the missile capability. It has uh, Nodong 1 and Nodong 2, which, uh, of which range is about 1,000 kilo kilometers to the 1,500 kilometers, and also doing uh, last October's military parade in Pyongyang, North Korea has shown the Musudan missile is it longer than the northern one. It, its range could become could be like around 3,000 to 3,500 you know, kilometers. Obviously, North Korea is aiming at Guam, 
as in a, uh, it, it's you know, what North Koreans call the you know, minimal nuclear deterrence. Okay? And as the short range you know, missile, North Korea is, has, has amassed quite a large number of SCUD, uh, SCUD B and SCUD C type of missiles. Therefore, as to delivery capability, with the exception of intercontinental ballistic missile, North Korea is known to have acquired intermediate range and short range missiles. Therefore, even second criterion, North Korea, in a, uh, North Korea passes in a second criterion too. And third variable is whether North Korea has conducted nuclear testing or not. North Korea conducted first underground nuclear testing on, August, on October 9th, 2006. It was not successful. But North Korea undertook the second in the underground nuclear testing that was on May 25th, 2006. We believe that the second nuclear testing was quite successful. Therefore, even nuclear testing, okay, now we can say that the North Korea has passed the third in a criterion of uh, nuclear weapon states. Finally, then, whether North Korea has a miniaturization technology or not, if, unless North Korea can mount those nuclear warheads at short range and intermediate range, then that warhead may not be usable. But we, our intelligence authority, believes that the North Korea has not yet developed that miniaturization technology to mount huge nuclear warhead onto the you know, short range and intermediate range in the missiles. Given all these things, it is, may we, can, we can say that the North Korea has almost become nuclear weapon states, full-fledged nuclear weapon states. Okay? Therefore, uh, North Koreans has been arguing that it's the ninth in a nuclear weapon state, meaning that uh, the big five, the so-called which are recognized as weapons, nuclear weapon state by the NPT, and then India, Pakistan, Israel, and now North Koreans are saying that it is ninth nuclear weapon state. But neither the United States nor South Korea, even China, are trying to accept it, because by definition, by NPT definition, North Korea, not, North Korea cannot become a legally nuclear weapon state. And second, we do not want to give you know, further bargaining leverage to North Korea. That for that reason, even though North Korea had reached the final stage of acquiring truly full-fledged nuclear weapons, we are not trying to recognize North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. Then why North Korea has been trying to have a nuclear weapons? They have all different kinds of interpretations. But I would say that if, if you look at the North Korean in documents and sources, uh, that's somehow in a, in a propaganda, but you can read North Korean intentions through you know, their propaganda, propaganda. But what they're saying is this, we are having nuclear weapons in order to assure minimal nuclear deterrence against the United States. Okay. North Korea, the United States used to maintain its nuclear arsenal, tactical nuclear arsenal in South Korea. Then the United States withdrew it 1990 through 1992 period, when the, the senior Bush decided to get rid of all the technical nuclear weapons in, in our part of the world. Okay. Even in, in Europe, you know, the United States really reduced the technical nuclear warhead. But the North Korean truly believe, particularly when I visit North Korea about 10 times, whenever I you know, have debate with, when I, whenever I had a debate with them, why the hell are you having nuclear weapons? It's not in use. But they strongly believe that the, when the military strike comes from the United States, it will take the form of nuclear and conventional. Therefore, North Korean perception of American nuclear attack it's real, not contrived, when I have interview with those guys. And second important issue is this. You know, when I talk with the you know, military, senior military folks in North Korea, that, that was before 2000, you know, 2008, another important point is this. North Korea wanted to really, in, in order to cope with growing gap in conventional arms race. North Korea has, it appears to me that North Korea has you know, uh, sought this nuclear card. Right now, South Korea's defense spending is about $24 billion. North Korean GDP, two years ago, 
was about $22 billion. Therefore, our defense spending is larger than North Korean economic size per se. Therefore, in, in terms of conventional arms race, there is no way for North Korea to beat or cope with South Korea. Therefore, North Korea has been pursuing all these asymmetric in the weapons options of, for example, special forces to penetrate in, into South Korea at the time of major country. Why? North Korea has amassed a quite large number of about 370 long-range artillery pieces along the DMZ, demilitarized zone, which can hit you know, the heart of the Seoul metropolitan city, even Gyeonggi province too. And along with those as asymmetric you know, forces, now North Korea is playing with this nuclear card to you know, cope with deterioration, uh, what inferiority in the conventional arms race. Third reason is much more political. Okay. Kim Jong Il got his, you know, success. Uh, Kim Jong Il succeeded his, from his father in 1994 upon the death of his father Kim Il Sung in 1994, and then he was having real hard time. What North Korea called so-called the march of hardship, in you know, the very bad economic conditions, bad harvest, and all these kinds of things. He overcame that hard time by adopting ideology of so-called military first politics ideology. Military comes first. Okay? Military has become guardian of the republic. Okay? Therefore, in other words, by co-opting the military and utilizing military as his you know, guardian, Kim Jong-il you know, adopted the military politics as a governing ideology. And then it's quite natural for Kim Jong-il to co-opt the military by giving something. That something was nuclear you know, weapons. And at the same time, by having nuclear weapons, he can tell his own people that now we are the nuclear weapons state. He can, enhance, he can enhance international prestige. At the same time, they can contribute enhancing his political legitimacy. Therefore, co-optation of the military, on the one hand, and enhancement of international prestige and domestic political legitimacy, those two things could have facilitated in the Kim Jong-il to pursue these nuclear weapons. There are some other reasons. Some scholars argue that North Korea has been developing nuclear weapons for the purpose of earning hard currency. I doubt, you know, because cost, cost of doing that is much greater than the benefit of not doing it. If I don't really think that the North Korea has been developing nuclear weapons for the sake of you know, earning you know, hard currency. Another, people, another scholars argue that the North Korea has been doing that for the sake of a, a better bargaining position in the six party talk process or bilateral negotiation with the United States. But I would say that there is a post facto explanation rather than genuine rational behind North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons card. Then now, what is happening right now? As you may know that China, the United States, South Korea, North Korea, Japan, Russia, all six countries together got together and they agreed to, agreed to seek negotiated settlement, negotiated settlement of North Korean nuclear problems through negotiation, multilateral negotiation. That format was the six-party talk processes. And six-party talk processes adopted two important you know, documents. One is September 19th of 2004, joint statement. The statement really, you know, phenomenal statement. I would say that that is one of the best diplomatic you know, documents I have seen since the you know, end of the Second World War. Why? Because first, North Korea agreed to get rid of all the nuclear weapons and materials and programs in verifiable manner, even irreversible manner too. The United States has agreed to re get rid of all the hostile intention and policies and seek peaceful coexistence with North Korea, at the same time have a diplomatic normalization with North Korea. These two actions are implemented simultaneously. Then all other countries, meaning South Korea, China, Japan, United States, and Russia, were supposed to provide North Korea with economic assistance and energy assistance. 
And at the same time, when there is a progress in dismantlement of, dismantling of North Korean nuclear weapons, then all the six party talk would facilitate new negotiation for peace, creating peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. You may, as you may know that now Korea, the Korean Peninsula is still governed by armistice and agreement. In fact, the Korean War is not yet over because it, since it is governed by armistice in a agreement. Therefore, we wanted to transform this armistice agreement into a viable peace regime. And this, this September 19 joint statement made, it, made that point very clearly. And finally, the September 19 joint statement also encouraged to have a new forum for the creation of security and peace mechanism in Northeast Asia is multilateral security cooperation regime. Therefore, if you look at the, the really September 19th joint statement, it's a really outstanding you know, statement. And then there was a February 13 agreement because after in the Sixth Party talk adopted the September 19th you know, joint statement, then there was a whole issue re related to the so-called Banco Delta Asia and the financial sanction in North Korea and everything was stopped. And as a way of rekindling the six party talk process, finally the six party talk has, agree has produced the February 13 agreement. According to that agreement, North Korea would take uh, three steps toward the verifiable dismantling of nu its nuclear programs and weapons. That is, first is uh, shutting down and sealing of its nuclear facilities in Yongbyon. Second phase is disabling them. And third one is verifiable dismantling of nuclear programs and materials, but it was not clear about the nuclear weapons. But problem started with this implementation of this one. And North Korea did shut, North Korea did shut down and seal its nuclear facilities, and IEA sent inspectors there and made inspection. Phase one went very, went very well, and phase two even went very well too, as you have seen in the CNN. North Korea really get rid of the whole this, you know, uh, you know, the reactor, you know, cooling facilities and whatever. They, you know, visibly showed, showed to the world. But the problem occurred in the transition between second phase and third phase. At a time, that was the, the last, in the months of, in the Bush administration, the hardliners in U.S. Congress began to argue that the, there's no such a thing as just simple disabling. The every disabling must be verifiable disa disabling. Okay? But the North Korean response was that that is against in the February 13 agreement. There's no such a thing as verifiable disabling. What we agreed was just disabling. But when you get in third phase of dismantling, then it will be verifiable dismantling. Okay? Therefore, and also North Koreans argued that, uh, look, even without having a protocol on verification, you know, how the hell are you are asking us to have verifiable disabling? But this dispute you know, occurred in that context. And then South Korea supposed to you know, provide 50,000 metric tons of heavy oil to North Korea by the end of March. Then there was a change of the government in South Korea. And we have a new Im Young-bak government. Im Young-bak government has been pursuing what they call the principled hardline policy in North Korea. And the, and our government you know, took sides with you know, hard lines in Washington. You know, the disabling should have verification you know, procedures too. If not, then we wouldn't provide in North Korea with heavy oil. And we didn't provide heavy oil. And then North Korea, I wouldn't say it is just, you know, there's any causal links, but anyhow, North Korea then, April 5th, 2009, North Korea test launched its rocket. And then Obama administration was very angry about it, okay? And then there was another provocation by North Korea. That is what North Korea undertook a second nuclear testing on May 25th, 2009. Since then, everything began to fall apart. Then United Nations Security Council adopted the sanction resolution on North Korea. And then inter-Korean relations also getting worsened too. November 2009, there was a naval crash in West Sea in which South Korean Navy really defeated the North Korean Navy. And then in March 2010, North Koreans torpedoed South Korean in a, a corvette called the Chonan vessel. 
And then there was another you know, showdown in November 2010 in Yanpyeong Island. Okay? South Korean Marines were engaging in you know, artillery exercise, and North Korea just you know, you know, st struck, made a strike on those our, you know, the K9 in self propelled you know, artillery guns and killing two soldiers and two civilians. Now, after I'm going through this process, there was you know, no chance of a so-called you know, dialogue you know, between among six party talk processes. The South Korean government position is very clear. Unless North Korea makes an apology on the issue of Chanan, the sinking of Chanan and Yanpyeong in a shelling, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't have any kinds of meaningful talk with North Korea. But Chinese government position is this: even Americans, you know, really pushing South Korean government and North Korean government to have a dialogue first, and then that would be succeeded by the North Korean DPR, uh, North Korean U.S. bilateral dialogues, and then there would be resumption of six party talk processes. Now this time. That message went to Pyongyang, but Pyongyang is not responding it. Okay? But again, our government position is this. If you really want to have a bilateral talks, then you got to make an apology to the you know, Chanan incident and uh, Yanpyeong incident. North Korea is saying that we didn't do Chanan incident. And Yanpyeong case, it was our self, you know, it's just right, righteous measures on the part of North Korea to, for the sake of self-defense. Therefore, it really, it has become really incompatible or incommensurate in the demands on both sides. But without having improved inter-Korean relations, it's not worse to have six party, to resume six party talks and use six party talks as a vehicle of solving North Korean nuclear problem. Therefore, now entire situation you know, stalemated. You know. That is a big problem. Then now, what is the implication of succession politics in North Korea on the nuclear issue. I personally believe that they could be very, very positive. Why? Reason is very simple. Kim Jong-il has been pursuing so-called Gang Seong Daegu ideology, meaning strong and prosperous great nation. He promised North Korean people that he would achieve Gang Seong Daegu, the strong, prosperous great nation by year 2012, next year. But he achieved strength by having nuclear weapons, but prosperity is not. Now, his son now is about to fuck the hair to his father you know, since September last year. That's his son, Kim Jong-un's goal would be what? His mission mandate is to revitalize the economy. But without showing sincere attitude to the nuclear issues, there's no way you know, Kim Jong-un would get the economic assistance from outside, outside world. If he should make some kinds of you know, compromise, otherwise his legitimacy will be jeopardized. And particularly if you look at the recent shakeup in North Korean governing structure, you can clearly see the, the priority being placed on the economy. For example, Prime Minister Choi Young Nim, he was the Secretary General or the Chief of Staff to Kim Il Sung, okay, in late 1980s and early 1990s. He's one of superb economic specialists. Another person is Hong Seok Hyun. He's the head of the Department of Finance and Planning of Korea Workers' Party. He's also a very well-known economic you know, specialist. But the way, if you look at the entire you know, staffing of the Korea Workers' Party and government structure, you can clearly see the growing emphasis on the economy. Because otherwise, if Kim Jong-un cannot show the really amazing performance in the economic arena. His succession cannot be justified. Then there could be a palace coup, or there could be a military coup. If in the medium to longer term, there could be in a, the overall in a people's uprising there. Therefore, for Kim Jong-un, the son of Kim, Kim Jong-il, the ultimate mandate is to revitalize the economy. But there is. I see some kind of tangential point here. If, if South Korea and the United States and China work together very closely in such a way to convince Kim Jong-un that you make concession on the nuclear issues, then your regime 
and your economic revitalization will be assured. I think that then, that could be very in a, uh, interesting formula. But one thing, by way of concluding, you know, let me just add one more point. That is, if you analyze uh, North Korean behavior very carefully, whenever six party talks were moving smoothly, North Korea never showed any provocative behavior. Whenever six party talk process was stalled for whatever reasons, then North Korea resorted to provocative behavior. Therefore, for me, it is a known fact that North Korea has a nuclear warhead. Therefore, what is it? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be easy for us to expect North Korea to give it up at once, unless there is a fundamental regime change in North Korea. Then what we can do is that we should, put the, we should freeze North Korean nuclear activities, make sure that the North Korean nuclear programs, materials, and weapons are transparent. Meanwhile, we engage in negotiating with North Korea. Eventually, then we can get rid of nuclear materials and weapons in the medium to long term. But, but final was this. Unless there is a fundamental change in regime character of North Korea, or regime per se, we may not be able to resolve North Korean nuclear problems. Then the whole point is how can we make uh, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un into like a, such a leader as uh, Deng Xiaoping, OK? That would be the you know, very important you know, task for all of us. But one thing is very clear. Unless external security environments surrounding North Korea is congenial, it is very unlikely that North Korea to pursue opening reform, even internal political reforms. Therefore, my basic argument is let us assure stable security environments, if not the so-called assurance of his regime security, okay, let, make sh let us sure that the North Korea adopt the opening and reform. Then I think, and then we just freeze North Korean nuclear activities, and make, make them uh, transparent, engage in negotiation, then five to six years, I think that we, can, we might be able to make a major breakthrough. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this very comprehensive presentation of uh, what is uh, a more critical issue to the world than most of us take in on a daily basis, I think. Let's move on to uh, Deputy Minister Espen Bart Eide. He is, uh, as I said earlier, a Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway. He uh, came from the post as the Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Defense uh, last summer, but also have a past in the post that he's currently in, back uh, at the beginning of the last uh, decade. Uh, he has also a background in research uh, at uh, our close uh, collaborator and competitor, the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, NUPI, here in uh, Oslo. Uh, he has, amongst other things, uh, while being at NUPI, led the work uh, for the UN uh, that led to the report on uh, integrated missions, a rather in influential report that uh, came out in 2005 related to the need for reform of the UN and uh, I could talk at length about a number of other achievements but I think I won't do that because we are interested to hear what uh, Espen has to say uh, in response to Shumun Moon's uh, introduction. The floor is yours. Thank you very much Christian, it's great to be here with Prio again and, uh, and thank you very much to Professor Tung Min Moon for, uh, for his uh, extremely interesting uh, overview of uh, the situation. I also had the pleasure of listening to you yesterday in another seminar about uh, economic developments in South Korea and I am very happy for this focus on the region that we're having these days uh, here in Oslo. Um, I, should, I should actually begin where, where, uh, where also Christian was that this issue is actually much more important for all of us than we up here in the North May, Northwest Maybe. Since we're filming it, can I yeah, take please. the liberty of equipping you with a microphone? Uh, by all means. Although yeah. I failed to use my own microphone. Yeah, so yeah, but, uh, <laughs> point that you know it's it's actually extremely important for everybody this is definitely not an issue that we should leave to the Koreans alone I mean it's it's a, it's an issue of major regional importance and a major global importance both uh, because of the way it affects on the Asian security dynamics 
and of course also in the way it affects the gl global disarmament and nuclear agenda in general. So for, for both those reasons, there, is every, there are very many strong arguments for a, an, a, a strong engagement from our side, both on the political side and also in the academic community. <coughs> I should also say that, uh, just remind you all, that uh, Norway has been, you know, had played its small role in, uh, in, uh, in Korean security issues for many, many years because we were involved in the operations in the early 50s uh, with, uh, with a field hospital that was serving under the UN flag for several, uh, several years. So a lot of Norwegians actually served in military uniform and in related areas uh, during the, the war in, uh, in Korea. And uh, at the end of that war, Norway was appointed one of the 16 countries that have a part had the responsibility of ensuring that the ceasefire would turn into peace. And that's uh, still work in progress. I think the expectation at the time was that you know, we, we now have a ceasefire line, which was basically what you had, uh, very much defined by military realities on the ground uh, as uh, conflicts often end. And now the preparation should start for transforming that into a peace agreement. And uh, strikingly, that is still has still not happened. So the Korean War, as, uh, as Professor Moon said, is, isn't over in a formal sense. Uh, um, and of course, that has been lingering on as a major issue for uh, South Korean politics and obviously for North Korean politics and also for regional politics since then. Uh, on the other hand, it should also, it's also important to, you know, to place this whole issue of uh, North Korea and, and, and intra-Korean relations in the context of what we you see very, very vividly in the foreign ministry, and I think everybody else sees it here as well, you know, this geopolitical shift to the east, to East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, which really points in a direction where this indeed is a nation century, uh, more than an Atlantic century, Pacific century more than Atlantic century. And I think for us Norwegians and for Europeans, we simply have to prepare for a world in which you know, events very close to our home, like the Berlin Wall or the division of Germany or the East-West conflict as seen from Europe, you know, is not any longer uh, the center of attention. You now, partly for good reason and, for, and, 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 and that's good news because, uh, you know, it, it wasn't that pleasant to be so close to the center of the problem. Uh, but, but of course, it also means that the, the, the global dynamics will be much more influenced by what's going in on in Asia and in the Pacific region than what is going on in Europe and North America. And also that our major, our common major ally, the United States, uh, you know, remains engaged on both arenas, but it is increasingly in demand in the Asian region because, you know, rather than the picture of America pushing itself on, you know, pushing its presence on the Asian states, what we're seeing now, there's a number of Asian states asking the US to stay and even to increase its presence because of the Asian dynamics with the growth of China, uh, which some countries want to accommodate and be a part of, and with other countries have this more mixed idea that, well, the growth of Asia is good news, but there should be a balance that could be in the US. So my point here is simply that the, the security dynamics that we would traditionally say, this is something that's happening over there, it's interesting, you know, we should be, you know, follow it, but it's not core. Uh, to our own security is increasingly uh, a part of our own security as well, as most people who could have listened if it really went bad, that you really had the, uh, a, a military exchange of large proportions between North and South, it would be clearly a global repercussions, security-wise, politically, economically, in all, in all, all, possible, uh, all possible aspects. Um, and, and uh, while I think it's, it's, it's safe to, uh, uh, to um, assume that neither side has anything close to a casus belli that, uh, or any intention of actually going in that direction, of course, the, the level of tensions, as we've been seeing even last year, uh, is so high that uh, r relatively small events, misinterpretations, and maybe exaggerated moves from one side can lead to even more exaggerated sides responses from from the other side, in this case, of course, North uh, Korea to, to, the, uh, to the exercises that were being held, uh, admittedly in areas which are contested. Uh, and that's sort of a part of the story which is sometimes overlooked, that uh, the, the, uh, the North, North Korea, to a certain extent, has an argument that these areas are not finally settled as they see it. And of course, that in itself is being disputed. Um, another observation, when you look at the security dynamics of East Asia, and so, you know, both East Asia, Asia and Southeast Asia as well, is that 
this is a world in which realpolitik, you know, classical realism still applies. So, you know, the, uh, the, the idea that we have developed, particularly in Europe, that we have transcended the classical security dynamics by, by building a security community, which was actually first coined to describe a situation among the Nordic countries, and which I think most people would argue does exist among most European states, that while we have differences, nobody in their right mind would even dream of the idea of using force to solve them. That is definitely not the case in, among many, uh, you know, the majority of Asian countries. Not only North and South Korea, where this is most obvious, but even among countries which are politically much more similar, similar that you, you are not really excluding the possibility. And just look at the fact that we had you know, actual military exchange between Cambodia and Thailand. For reasons most of us, it's a little bit difficult to grasp, you know, why, why these four kilometers, square kilometers were that important. But, you know, this still happens in the region. So classical security policy logic applies to a much higher degree. This is quite obvious to anybody in Asia, but it's important to say it in the European uh, and Norwegian audience because we kind of, um, you know, we have to understand that these, these dynamics are different and the whole way of looking at it is, is different between or two parts of the world. Now, and of course, the, com combining the two things I've said so far, that this region is becoming more important, our region is becoming less important, and the fact that the security logic is more, should we say, to borrow you know, Robert Cooper's language, more modern rather than postmodern. I mean, there, you could argue against that, that dichotomy. And add to that, that the, the level of interaction between the peoples in, in Asia, in, I mean, travel, economic exchange, trade, is growing to the extent that it's becoming almost like the inter-European relations, but without the institutions in place that manages it, is actually suggesting a major, issue, major problem. Because when, you, when, when, when two countries have a re relatively limited contact, you could basically do with a little bit of foreign policy and, and, and classical diplomacy, and you settle the border and so on, and that's it. But of course, when the level of interaction is intense, you need much more than that. So what we have been able over after many failures and many world wars and all the trouble in, in, in Europe in actually establishing institutions like the European uh, Union, like, like the Council of Europe, like the OSCE, like, the, uh, like NATO, particularly the dimension of NATO, which is internal rather than external, uh, there is no real parallel to that uh, in Asia. And I think that's going to be one of the big challenges of the 21st century, to build those institutions in due time uh, before uh, the, so, so that you can actually turn what is potentially problematic into something potentially positive. You know, th that is sort of intense interaction. Now, how does all this relate to the Korea issue? Well, there's one element of good news, which is that there is, some, there is this thing called the six party talks. Yes, they're stalled, they're not taking place right now. But of course, there is a big difference between. 1990s, the, 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 the beginning of the 21st century, in the fact that, you know, this time China and the US actually wants to be part of the same set of security institutions dealing with the North Korea issue. Uh, fundamentally different, of course, from the foundations of the original Korean War. So, so I've been arguing that the six party talks are important beyond their eventual success in North Korea. I mean, hopefully they succeed. But even if they don't succeed, at least they make sure that key players are occasionally in the same room and trying to you know, read, look at the issue through more or less the same lens. Uh, and that should be protected uh, in and by itself. Um, our posi position is you know, quite obviously that this exporty talks must resume. The parties, uh, and, and we, will, we say that, and I, I very recently met the North Korean ambassador who was here uh, in, uh, he's not stationed here, but he was here in relation to the, to the 17th of May events, and we reiterated our strong encouragement for them to come back to the negotiating table without uh, conditions, as of course we're making the same point when we see much more frequently our, our South uh, Korean friends, that it's really important now to get this back on track. It's really important that the UN sanctions and the, sort of the UN um, uh, requirements and the conditions are, are respected and that the room is found for, for the IEA and, and so on. Then, then to the, towards the end, there's this question of whether change is possible. I mean, I should first say, you know, second last is, Norway has a relatively significant engagement in North Korea on the humanitarian side. Uh, and we've been trying to make a point, which we also made in many other circumstances elsewhere in the world, that um, you know, we have solidarity with the North Korean people regardless of what their government does. 
it's, it's rather obvious that we would not engage in anything looking like development aid, you know, benefiting a government here. But the humanitarian activities are, are ongoing and we have just increased them and we'll continue to have a, a, a humanitarian role. That also gives us some access that not everybody else has. And we actually do get the re response from, from uh, Pyongyang that they do see this and they do value it and they appreciate the fact that we have this sort of continued humanitarian engagement. I'm not suggesting in any way that we do that because of the access. We do it because of the humanitarian imperative but it also gives a certain amount of access, to put it that way, once, once you're at it. And through that, of course, we see the extreme underdevelopment and the extreme, uh, extremely difficult conditions that the people in North Korea are living through. I mean, it's, it's really serious. I mean, there, it's a structural malnutrition. Uh, South Koreans are, you know, you, know you, can, you can see it on the people that they are, uh, uh, you know, malnourished, that they're having serious uh, challenges to to their uh, growth, for instance, and so on. And, uh, um, and, and we're very, very concerned for this. Now, is there then any kind of room for gradual change? Um, it's difficult really to see that because of the, the nature of the regime, which is you know, an extreme version of something we have seen lighter versions of many parts of the world, but, the, but it seems to be such an extreme version. But so we thought about other regimes that also changed. And as a small inspiration, I was recently visiting Myanmar last week, uh, actually as the first Western government representative to go to see them after they, in, you know, after the new civilian regime came in. And it's actually, uh, you know, why I would be very careful not to compare because the differences are rather striking between the two countries. But it was a country where a military dictatorship is gradually retracting, slowly opening up for uh, sharing of power with other people under strict control. Uh, but, but where it seems to be an attempt to say, this isn't working. We're not going to hand it over to the others, but we can open up somewhat. And of course, what will be the really big question, which is very much where you ended as well, is, is it at all possible to think that there is something of that sort that can happen in uh, Pyongyang and in North Korea? And what could we do to encourage it? And how can we make sure that we do that in such a way that it leads to more stability and not less stability and chaos and collapse and all the consequences that could come out of that? Because the current type of regime in North Korea appears to me to be a regime that would react to weakness by playing even stronger, and uh, which is probably one of the most dangerous dynamics that, that, that is around. So, you know, to get the multilateral system back on track, to frame the whole issue in a broader setting of strengthening intra-Asian uh, uh, security logic, uh, and also to def define the role of the international regimes, including the nuclear uh, disarmament regimes, uh, is very much on the agenda also here. And hence, I very much appreciate the fact that we have this debate uh, today. Thank you very much, uh, Espen.